to the OKD Working Group Documentation Subgroup Meeting for June 28th of the year 2022. And the agenda has been shared in the chat. And uh, now we can look at the agenda and see if there's anything folks want to change or add real quick. I'll give you 30 seconds to do that. Scan it over and see if there's... Good to me. All right. Folks good? All right. Uh, then let's uh, get started with uh, technical documentation. Uh, just for my part, uh, I did reach out um, to Jack, sent an email, and waiting to hear back on uh, CERN. Uh, seeing if they'll, if Jack will write like a little write up for us, either blog post or something we can put um, somewhere. Uh, and I also in chat reached out to Glenn Marcy, who's an OKD user who's doing single node. Uh, okay. And so um, uh, that I think um, uh, could yield some fruit. He said he was interested. And I just said, you yeah, know, just needs to be a blog post or something, just anything because we didn't have anything for SNL. Uh, up right now. So that's where I'm at. Brian, what do you got? Um, <clears throat> so I'm working through a number of threads. Um, I actually had quite a good discussion with Christian in Dublin about how to improve the documentation. I mean, one of the biggest challenges we've got is the prow um, and the work that it does sort of under the covers when it does builds. And for me, one of the biggest challenges is um, the image replacing. As I said, I I looked at every single repo that makes up OKD, and there are about 50 different images that are in the Red Hat CI registry. Um, obviously, there's there's about four different versions of Golang, and there's all sorts of different versions. Um, and one thing I'd be interested in is, can we get the source, the Docker file or the container file that makes up the runtime, but also more importantly, the build image um, that is substituted in Prow? It must be in a repo somewhere. Um, I don't know whether it's in public domain or whether it's sort of within the Red Hat firewall, but I had a chat with Christian and want to try and see if we can do that because if we have the source of truth for the images, then it, it helps people understand what's going on because at the minute that's a bit of a, a sort of a, a closed box area. So that's one area I'm looking at. Um, <clears throat> I also had a chat about, and I noticed we got in the to do's, the operators, um, and that seems to have stalled within Red Hat. Um, those are the priorities. So I'm just wanting to try and say, can we actually make that a community project? And once you've cracked the build, then there's no reason why we couldn't actually create an OKD community catalog that we can install that actually then puts all the missing operator pieces back into the operator hub um, catalogs. So that's something else I've been researching and looking at, um, but I, I think that'd be a great project for us to take on as a, as a community. Um, once we get our own Git repo, um, once we understand what the build and the runtime containers need to look like, there's no reason why we can't go and create an OKD community catalog, yeah. build it from. Um, and that, that means, I think that unlocks then OKD as a useful tool in a lot of other scenarios. Because at the minute, you can't follow the same steps for OCP to set OKD up because there's so much missing from that catalog. Everyone, everything says, oh, go and put the storage operator on, go put the GitOps or the pipelines operator on, and they're just not there for us. So I think having that catalog will bring us much closer to parity. So anybody who sees OCP instructions should be able to follow them on OKD um, to try and get that. So I've also been looking at what does that involve and how complex would it be? So. And um, again, 
I think a good idea would be if we can create a a workshop day. Let's break the back of it in a workshop day for those that are interested and maybe get some of the red hatters in as well. Put a skeleton catalog there and just see if we can how many operators we can actually populate. We could also reach out to the um, operator framework community um, and ask them put, to participate in that um, hackathon okay. day because um, they're they're trying to do more outreach as well. Um, they, okay. They're now a CNCF incubated project, but most of them are red hatters. Um, Austin McDonald is um, the community lead for, for that, sort of the Christian Lombeck of their side. Um, well, he might be someone if we if you really want to do this, and I and I think it's time. Um, we we've been waiting a very long time for yeah. Red Hat um, engineers to free up some resources, and it just doesn't feel yeah. like it's it's moving. Um, so yeah, it's not a bad sub project to take on. So. We had also talked about doing a hackathon on the CentOS Stream project as well. So, um, you know, we can we can do a series of them. I'm happy to, to host them. And, and yeah, them. I mean, I I, I think it would be quite a good idea because I mean, I it'll also help us build up the community because I think some people are are a bit wary on taking on a role a responsibility by themselves, but we'd we'll be quite happy to join a community effort. Yeah, I think that's so. I, I think having a quarterly hack day or something like that would be a good way just to move the community the community forward or something. Just something yeah. to. Well, I, I think I mean, that's that. Jamie. What do you think? I mean, um, you're nodding, but that's yeah. I think so. I think that that's a great idea. I think let's schedule the. Two, we have two ideas here in terms of hackathons and sort of figuring out in terms of scheduling what's going to work best so that we can get i gotta to jump to answer the door i'll be right back sure so brian uh, I, uh yeah. do you have you figured out uh an operator hub uh what flags uh allow okd to uh pull something in well it's it, it's actually not what it pulls in it's it's during the build of the catalog because OKD only has a single catalog installed, which is the community catalog at the minute. We, we actually don't, right. they're disabled. So we'd need to actually go and build a new and install a new catalog, which I suggest we call the OKD community catalog, which would then contain what's in the Red Hat catalog. But I also know that when Red Hat builds the community catalog, it's built for OCP, it's not built for OKD. Um, and some of the links go back to Red Hat Marketplace, some of the links go into the Red Hat catalog. And I think that's that, I think that's what you're talking about, why some things suddenly disappear from that catalog. And so right, I well, haven't this... yet found the source of that. I don't know how they build that, where the source of that catalog is. Okay, but it seems to, it seems to uh, it's not related to an update. Uh, you know, if you keep your system stable, uh, the catalog will change from time to time. Uh, so it looks like yeah, something but, but, is periodically updated. Yeah, but don't forget the catalog updates at a different time to OKD. There's an operator that updates the catalog source right. from, a, from a wherever. And I think the default is every day. So it'll go out to the internet every day and see if there's new operators or updated operators available. I think that's how it works. So I, I, I think it's at the co at the catalog. I think the catalog changes rather than OKD filtering it and saying I'm not going to let you install these ones. I think we get to see everything that's in the catalog, but what's in the catalog changes. Right. Yeah, because and sometimes. Uh... Even if it's an operator that you recognize, it's a very old version of it. Yeah, because I mean, basically, a catalog is just a container with a YAML file in or a JSON file in, which is actually the content, and that then links out to the operator images, which is what then gets installed. Um, so I, I don't think there's anything magical about why the operator hub would hide 
a catalog that's uh, an operator that's in the catalog but again i'm 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 learning this and trying to pick up all the sort of subtleties i know the basics but i'm trying to work out but i've i've yet to find out which repo builds the community catalog um and, and fully understand that but um so i i think it's probably something we want to take to the main meeting um and just get people's feeling but i i got the feeling from um christian that the operators are sort of being put on hold by the scheduling people as a low priority so they're not likely to be delivered anytime soon so if we want them we're going to have to be proactive about it okay so it sounds like what we're saying is then let's schedule let's pick a date we can do that async we'll pick a date well one well what we'll probably have to do is first off decide a guest list right like who do we want to invite from the respective uh teams then do a poll to find out the date that will work best to get those people in the room um because we want to make sure that we don't have an event where a lot of members of the public show up but we don't actually have the people who are knowledgeable at that event well what i'm so hoping, does that sound like good next yeah go ahead Brian. yeah sorry what i'm hoping is i'm hoping that i can get the basics basic mechanic mechanisms working and have an OKD community operator running on, on my cluster with a couple of operators in there. So I've actually tested out the, on the beginning of the workshop, we can do a, a quick tutorial explaining how OLM works and, and demonstrate it with a couple of, of examples to actually kick off. Because I'm not sure if we say it's a three hour workshop, I'm not sure how much will get done, but I'm hoping that would be an event where someone will say, Oh, I'm going to go and try do the um, dev work workspace, or the I want to go and try and do the um, Tekton operator. I want to go and try and do the Argo operator. So we'll get people that we kick them off with the activity, and then we're going to see an onward momentum, and maybe create a Slack channel or or, or some way of actually continuing the work and the discussion after the event. Because I say with a three hour, if you've never done any operator stuff within three hours, you're you're not really going to get much done. So I'm hoping these are going to be sort of seeding activities where we sort of educate, spend the first hour educating people, give them a few examples in a repo that we can walk through and explain. And then maybe we can do a partial one on the day. Um, or, or maybe get two or three people to to host a, a, a one on a, on a specific operator and then continue. So I'm, I'm almost think we've got to seed, as you say, seed the event with two or three people that can, that have actually done it, worked out how it all works and then help anybody else that turns up. If we can get the Red Hat people that are doing this on OCP to be part of the hack even better, because that means they may be able to take their operator and do it on the day in three hours and, and, and we get stuff for free. But if it's just a, a public event, I think we have to make sure that there's one or two of us that have actually gone through the pain of working out how OLM works, how you create a catalog, how you create the, the operator bundles to populate the catalog and then how you can actually test it all works out. All right. Sounds like we have a plan moving forward. So let's put this in the to-dos. And Diane, did you catch some of that? No, I okay. did not. I apologize that post. That's okay. That's all right. That's all right. The gist is Brian's going to do everything and uh, get this all set up. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sammy. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Um, so that, that does sound like a good plan, though. Yep. We will get this together. Do we, um, we, the hackathon is, the operator hackathon is still a viable thing? Yeah, so so but basically what, what I said is that I think we need to seed the hackathon with two or three knowledgeable people 
So I'm actually going through, I'm, uh, over the next week or two, I want to create a catalog, install it on my thing, and just work out how to get an operator in there. Um, so I don't think, it, say we have a three-hour event, if someone's not familiar with operators, an operator hub, an OLM, I don't think they're going to be very productive in three hours. So I'm hoping that we can use the event almost like as an education session to get them started, to see some work going on. And then we need to maybe look at um, a social media channel where we can actually try and encourage the group to keep working after the event and use it as like a seeding event to get some work done. Yeah, um, so the, the operator framework people just came to me, Austin. I talk to him every Friday. Um, and they're trying, they were thinking about doing an operator con at KubeCon North America in Detroit. Um, okay. They haven't, yeah. But um, they are looking to do more, much more outreach. So we may be able to get someone to do a short talk on OLM. Um, and that, a that short talk. You know, and so that's why I was thinking, throwing Austin, asking maybe Austin to come to the next docs meeting. Um, and in, once you've done your exploration, hook you up with him and we can figure out how to make it an operator framework slash OKD joint hackathon thing. Yeah, yeah, that, then that'll bring be really those, good. Bring the two communities together and work on something. So yeah. and there's, there's and more I, people than both, yeah. And, and I know you do Project Key or Quay? Quay, Quay. <laughs> Um, and again, I, I know that they are in the community hub, but the dependencies aren't. So I don't know if there's anyone there that particularly knows, oh, yeah. like Nubar, because um, I think I think that needs object store as a dependency to get that okay. working. Okay. So again, if there's anybody that that knows Nubar, and I don't, I think you can do Nubar without Rook and Ceph. Nuba, Nuba, but, that's, that's the, um, yeah, that's Nuba, N-O-O-B-A, Nuba, yeah. Yeah, but that, that's the object store piece. That, oh. that gives you like S3 object storage on, on a cluster. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking if we can, if we can actually target, because I mean, I think the, the people we want, we want, I'm being selfish, I want a development environment. So I want Gitti. I want object store, I want GitOps, I want pipelines, and I want a registry, which is key quay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so figure out by the next docs team meeting or yeah. whatever you want, and which ones you can be, you can curate which ones we work on. If you're going to move this forward, move the needle forward, you know, curate the ones that we hack on, and I will try and find the owners of those guys for you to work with and maybe the if we do something a little bit longer like we introduce it with yeah anyways do your research yep. you know yep. and we can move on but yes thank you and I apologize yep. for having to step away there no worries, no worries. Right. okay so I think that's that, that's really it <laughs> okay great let's move on to our next topic which is uh Repository move and timeline. And Brian, do you have any updates on that? I, I think it's actually the, there was something in the to do. I thought there was something somewhere yeah. that we, it, it's really, how do we, oh, there it is, the MX record change. It's really, how do we line up the, the, the DNS folks within Red Hat okay. to do the move? And I'm just also thinking, I'm not an owner. I don't think I can do, so I might need somebody within the OpenShift organization yeah. that has the authority to do the transfer of the repos and also the OpenShift CS organization to do the transfer of the other repo. Yeah, so Will Gordon is the person and I'm gonna send an email and CC, um, well, I'm gonna, him and Brian and Jamie, Brian Innes, and I'll do that right now and um, give them the link. And if it's not Will Gordon, there will be somebody else. He he'll, he will know who can do it. So um, okay. well, well, we'll keep talking everybody and I'll just send hey, the email out. Diane, that is, so that's for actually for C names. 
that you're thinking of, Brian, or A records. The MX records yeah. is a separate issue. The MX records is the email question. Oh, sorry, that was sorry. Yes, that was. But, yeah, so MX yeah. records, which maybe if that's the same person, Diane, we could. We he could would at know. Least find out where to go, right? Yeah. So yeah. We could get uh, an email server set up. Okay, yeah. so so once we actually coordinate that, and then the other thing is, how do we coordinate the community? So when they go to that well-known place, we bounce some. I think GitHub automatically will redirect for a, a period unless somebody reclaims that that name. But I actually think we need to socialize and um, make sure that people don't get lost. Um, and obviously, all of the any documentation I can I can do the the main doc site and, and, and push all the changes to there. Um, but it, again, we probably need to be in the Google groups, um, the Slack, and then maybe the Twitter, we need to arrange that. And probably do, a build... heads, probably do a heads up, like not just mention it when we do it, but actually mention it ahead of time. Hey, we are going to be doing yeah, because I'm, I'm guessing we may be down for half a day. The okay. OPD site will go away for a certain amount of time as we're doing everything and getting everything sorted out. So it may be that on whatever day it is, OKD.io will not be available um, and the OpenShift repo. I, I mean, again, it'd be worth just checking with Christian. Is that going to break? I don't think that's used for anything in terms of the install releases yeah. or anything like that. That's all. In, that's yeah. all elsewhere. So I think it's just going to be the the two Git repos and the OKD.io site. That's all it'll really impact. But as soon as we got the Red Hat has lined up, I think we're ready to go. Just, just. All right. Uh, so I would say, Brian, put a note in that thread saying that Diane is, is reaching out uh, to Will Gordon. Will Gordon and the other gentleman is Jerry, Fa Jerry Fala. And um, I'm just sending out, Jerry's in um, the Czech Republic, so. Okay. And, and I'm sending him the link, so. Ah, All right, moving on to the next item, uh, cause this one's pretty straightforward is depersonalizing the home lab documentation. Um, I reached out to Vadim and he, it, he is totally on board. Um, and actually, Sri just r responded to me uh, a few minutes ago and he is on board. So we can move both of these uh, to blog posts and maybe put a tag like, uh, you know, home lab examples or um, just home labs or something. And this will give people an opportunity to share their home lab setups and not get it confused with a guide, which is an actual step-by-step. -step. Um, so we, let's just move those over uh, as time permits and we're good to go. And then we can promote these items as home lab examples or something uh, on the Twitter, uh, in the chat and stuff. I could just say, hey, look, there's some home lab examples. Okay, and then are we going to look to replace them with guides, or are we just going to remove the guide section? Uh, at the minute they are in the guide section. Right. I would say until we get some actual guides written that actually are follow this step by step thing. I mean, there is the one. I mean, but you mentioned I needed to revisit this as my oct guide, you know, um, doing vSphere UPI. Someone put a, uh, uh, a merge request actually, or an issue on the repo the other day. So someone, people are actually using my repo. I don't know if they're following the instructions or not. Um, that would, if I can clean that up a little bit and test it again, then I would say that would be one guide. So installing UPI on vSphere. Um, 
I thought we had more. Don't we have more of those written someplace? I mean, because the... I did one, and I know that there were, and Daniel I mean, was the... going to look at this. I thought was look at. Yeah, yeah, never, not well, nothing really happened. It sort of fizzled out. But there are more than just three and Vadim's up there. But uh, again, I, I think we need to work out what we what we mean by a guide, and actually have some form of standardization of, of what a guide is um, because there are some which are like I wouldn't actually call it a step-by-step -step instructions but there's like general you have to think about this then think about that then think about that but they're not exactly step-by-step -step. so Okay, so I'm writing a, uh, a to-do for myself to create a discussion item on guide guidelines. Let's I actually we were like do a template. We we're going to create a template. We can do that if we want it. To, if we want to, um, we can. Yeah, for sure. I just don't know if that might limit people in some sense. But it, uh, yeah, if it's a very general template, I think it would work. Yeah. Yeah, you might want to separate uh, the stuff that uh, doesn't change that often from the stuff that's version specific. Because I, mean, I think one of the problems with the guides that we have is that they're all tagged to some version. And so if you're going to use them, you need to change certain things from 4.6 to 4.10. And, and one of the but, things we talked about was having Daniel reach out to people or someone reach out to people regularly to update their stuff once a year. But I think we might have to select or find someone uh, to. But a lot, of, a lot of it doesn't have to, actually have to. A lot of the parts of it don't have to be updated. Some do. In the, <laughs> but yeah. Well, oh yeah, but I mean, like the the sort of uh, open shift part presumes that you already have uh, you know DNS set up and things like that, and that your nodes have a way of getting a name. And once you have that set up, then that will work for many versions of OKD. And you don't have to change that sort of services part. Um, uh, and the, on the other hand, every version of OKD may have certain quirks. Uh, but for the most part, it is a generic, you know, um, you know run the uh, cluster install command and then uh, you know, hustle to get your thing up within a day before all the certs expire. Uh, and, and I guess the other thing that could vary is the uh, uh, what version of operating systems you have to start with before the pivot uh, that will allow the pivot to succeed. Yeah. Because there have been versions where um, if you pick the wrong F costs, then it would all break even though that shouldn't really matter that much because the version of FCOS that you boot your uh, bootstrap node up in is not the one that's going to wind up using. Right. And this is where we want folks to test their guides, like actually run right. through their own guides or have someone run through their guides. And if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't work, then the person needs to update it or then we pull it offline. Or, or even better, create an Ansible or Terraform that implements the guide that we can automatically test, and then exactly, yeah, yep. Uh, my vote would be for uh, using Tecton pipelines to do it. Um, so Plus one let's then. I'll create it. Yeah, I'll create a ticket on guides, uh, and we'll start out with defining our template and basically just like five to ten sections that it needs to have and then we'll go from there and then what we'll do is second step after we define the template we can apply that template or, or compare against the current guides see if they adhere to that and if not then ask the authors to update sound like a plan all right uh let's see next up is 
got that. Um, <laughs> so the CentOS Stream CoreOS initiative. Uh, I don't know how many folks caught the last meeting, but it was uh, it's it's taken up discussion in the last two main meetings. Um, the topic has, and we actually had a member of the community step away because they're sort of frustrated with the proposed change. So, do we want to do we want to communicate this question to the larger community um, and get their thoughts, or do we want to just leave this to the main group to say yay or nay? We want this thing that that they're offering. Diane? So I think um, where we kind of left it at the last meeting, and I'll, I'll listen to the recording again, is they're going to build it whether we want it or not, right? So that's, so that, and what we offered, or what I um, offered to facilitate was um, once they have it built, to reach out to the our community and other communities to test it and to do a deployment hackathon and see if it sticks, if it's anything um, that's sticky. Um, and it will be members of the working groups, you know, whether they participate in testing it or not, will kind of be the litmus test, I think, for whether it gets any traction. Whether we do, um, whether we, the OKD working group, take it on as a sub-project, um, I think is still out there in the ether as a conversation, you know, whether people will actually use it or not. Um, uh, but uh, it's coming, basically. It's getting built. So I, I'm, I personally, because I'm a Red Hatter and they employ me, I'm going to have to do the work around publicizing it. Um, at, but the working group does not have to take it up as a, a piece de resistance or whatever cause whatever the word is. Well, so here's here's my understanding of the situation, though, is that so it is given that it's going to be used internally. It's not a given that it's going to be provide that a release of OKD will be provided. That's what they're asking the working group uh, or the community to, to decide is if there will be an OKD release, yeah, an actual release with that. So there, there will be. No, that I, I'm just going to clarify. There will be a release. It will be the MVP release of this thing called um, OKD for SCOS. So there will be a yeah, release. Sure. Whether they do it repeatedly and keep pushing okay. it out in a um, in a in a landing page of our choice somewhere um, that we publicize as OKD working group is another is the question of is this something people want? And I think it's kind of, at this point it's early to ask people, is this something they want when there is no thing there? Um, right. So and, and maybe is, is the thing. Okay, so maybe we misstepped by putting as much time in the discussion as we did, because now I feel like maybe we need to do a little bit of messaging at least to, to, to say what you just said and what I think we're sort of agreeing on is that this is going to happen anyway internally. There will be a version, a, a release for the community to try. I think we should at least say that to clarify because anyone watching the videos or having participated in conversations may not really know where this stands and, and be that clear and concise on it. Yeah, Brian. Jamie, I, I was a little taken aback by last meeting. Um, and some people I thought would support the idea were vehemently against it, and I I think we need to un we need to understand what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether some of this is coming from the CentOS withdrawal, whether there's still some acrimony around that. I mm -hmm. sense that that might be it, but I also part of me thinks it's because the community doesn't feel empowered at the minute. So if Red Hat decides that SCOS is the thing that they're interested in, they can just pull FCOS and we're going to be left hanging. So I think part of the solution of this is really potentially to do with, can we actually get this first cloud initiative going? And if the community 
can do a build and a release of S of ECOS or SCOS, mm -hmm. and we're not beholden to Red Hat, then a lot of what was discussed last week goes away. And I think that might be the, the, the issue that I think there's worry that if we go down this route, because I, I think strategically, SCOS is the most, it's the upstream version of RHEL Core OS. The SCOS Core OS is going to be the upstream version of RHEL Core OS. So from a product commercial point of view, that is probably going to be the more valuable exercise for Red Hat to spend their engineering time on. I don't think that's, um, as you said, they're going to do it. They needed to actually test the driver for RHEL Core OS, and that's why they're doing it. And, and Sorry, I think, um, yeah, so let me, let me just add one thing and then Diane. So one of the things that I did pick up on in conversations with at least one person was that if F cost gets pulled, there's a sense that the CentOS upstream it doesn't have that same sort of, oh, I know where to file this bug in Fedora to get this addressed. I know, you know, that this is a, a Fedora issue or this is a Fedora Core OS issue. Yeah. And it's clear, clearer where you would file a bug. And, and some of the people have been very, who are concerned, have been very active in sort of being point people with, oh, this is a Fedora Core OS bug. This is a, uh, uh, Fedora bug, uh, etc. So I think once that, along with this, if we sort of elucidate how people can file bugs and work within the CentOS and CentOS core stream core OS community mm -hmm. to get bugs addressed and to have that same channel channels of communication, that same process, that might alleviate some of the pain. I think uh, you, you nailed you nailed it. Thank you for for describing it. Is that I think that's that that one of the primary issues for me is 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 the CentOS stream or SCOS as people are calling it CentOS Stream Core OS. Um, is it uh, an open project? Is it something that's going to be um, that we can have give feedback to engineering and what are those processes? And Timothy was Timothy Ravier who was on the call. Um, is working through that and, and is going to just, you know, figure out what those processes are for us because he's basically the person doing the, the work on SCOS. Um, and, and there are mechanisms for doing that. But to me, what my big, my bigger concern about that is that it's not being run like an open source project. It is an internal thing that, you know, we may not, like, just like Brian, we described you trying to hack through, trying to figure out these internal bits and pieces for the operator stuff, we'll have the same issue with the CentOS stream one. And as an open source community, which is what OKD is, we'll be still, you know, handcuffed to um, not really having a great feedback mechanism for the testing and deployment results even, you know, if it turns out. And, and people have over the past, two or three years, gotten really comfortable engaging with the Fedora Core OS community, and they have a lovely set of processes and guidelines and release things that are very pu public and very transparent. So that, to me, is a bit of a red flag, I have to say, um, which is why I'm not putting a lot of, I, I'm I don't, not putting a lot of blog posty stuff out there and like promoting the CentOS stream Core OS OKD yet. I just want to get them to release the MVP so that we can test it and then try giving feedback through whatever Timothy sets up for us. And if it's sufficient and we feel like we can do it, and at the same time, keep raising these issues about it not being a true open source distro of CoreOS. Uh, I'm just going to say it. I don't care if they fire me. It's like it bugs me. Um, that it's not going to have its own landing page, um, and that maybe will it, there was a little in, innuendo that maybe we would put up a landing page under OKD for this thing. There was even a suggestion that we call it OKD OS, not CentOS Stream Core OS, which I really will object to, you know, vehemently. As much as I like OKD, I don't think there's any, yeah, there's no reason for that. But they, so there's this this thing that 
talk, took me off guard last week too around the lack of a true open source project around or processes around CentOS Stream. And I could be wrong. I could have had, you know, got ears and not been listening to it. And Timothy, we could have had English as a second language issues too. So I'm giving people the benefit of the doubt that with this MVP, there will be some processes and we, we can improve them. Um, and the, the, I had a conversation as well with um, Neil from Dato right after the call. And the interesting thing to me is, and he's got, he has a long standing relationship with the CentOS community, uh, as many OKD working people, working group people do as well. So he knows all the history. And even in spite of all that, what he said to me, the use case for Dato um, was they probably would deploy this in production because he can't, he cannot get his IT team to allow him to deploy OKD using Fedora CoreOS because they are required by compliance to run some security package that they pay for and it doesn't run on Fedora CoreOS. And I think there is a use case out there for OKD on SCOS for people like that. And I don't call them, and, the, and I, I think I had this conversation with you, Jamie, so I'm, we're recording this, so I'm just saying, I, they are not the t that same kind of people that are currently in the OKD working group. Right now in the OKD working group, we have people who are willing to hack on Fedora CoreOS, hack on OKD, hack through prowl logs, do all that. I think there's another group of end users, let's call them, um, who will just use it, you know? And so we will get this adoption and there will be some feedback and on both OCP and on RHEL, you know, whatever. So the feedback mechanism is a good thing, but I don't think there, other than workload and use cases and maybe issues with deployments, we're gonna get them to be as active as you guys um, in the working group. Um, Cause they're gonna be the, like the GoDaddy hosting kind of folks. They're gonna people just use it. And well, there are lots of people who do that with open source projects. We haven't been attracting those people because it's too bloody complicated right now. Um, and we need people, we need to retain both of those communities or and gain back. And I think we lost those end user-ish people who just wanted to run it. So I think this is an opportunity for the working group to grow. I don't think it's gonna grow technical resources um, in the community. I think it's gonna, and we have to be aware of that because it's gonna be a resource hog. This is people will ask questions um, and want tech support for this and, if there is no feedback mechanism to Timothy that is effective or to um, the team that's doing the releases that's effective, they're going to come to us and we're going to waste copious amounts of goodwill and time from this team on those efforts. So I'm very cognizant of this is an MVP. We're going to see if people are interested in it and which kinds of people are and what the feedback mechanisms are. And that's my feel. Um, and I, I think everybody's in semi-violent agreement with me, but... Um, Bruce, you had something. Uh, yeah, no, the... Um, uh, I, I guess uh, the, the use cases for why this is useful haven't quite been presented. Okay, so the security tool issue is a good use case. Uh, so that's uh, compelling. Uh, but uh, the the, uh, the way it's been presented so far is just a shiny new toy here. You know, play with it, isn't it fun? And it did sort of threaten the FCOS people, I would say, uh, because it told them, hey, you're you know, you may not have a job in a few months. And uh, so there was a little bit of reaction to that. Oh. I don't know that that's I don't know that that's true because FCOS is a what one thing and I, I tried to highlight this in the in the last main meeting is the FCOS folks are trying to orient FCOS as being a sort of neutral container operating system. You can run it on its own. You can run it in other cluster technologies, um, etc. So I don't it doesn't I don't because that's a volunteer effort as well. I think. Um, yeah. I don't think it threatens their job so much. I think the 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 security thing it probably would be FIPS, right? 
So FIPS, right. you can't do FIPS on um, FCOS. CentOS, you can do FIPS. So if if that means that CentOS stream core OS means that OKD can finally do FIPS, that's pretty big because even I haven't been able to use OKD in all the situations I'd like to because of its inability to support FIPS. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, but uh, but my my concern though is that uh, the or, or one of my concerns about the whole CentOS thing is that it seems to have fallen flat on the upgradable issue. Okay, like when I started with uh, Linux, uh, every time there was an update, you had to completely reinstall from scratch with Slackware. And Red Hat introduced, you know, RPM updates. This is like, you know, decades ago. And that was a huge, huge improvement. You didn't have to uh, plug in 70 floppies anymore to upgrade your machine. Okay, so I dropped Slackware and switched to Red Hat instantaneously. Um, and since then, the you know it's sort of changed its labeling several times, uh, but it's always had pretty good update history. And I recently updated uh, you know Fedora desktop system from 34 to 36, no problems. Uh, now going from CentOS to Stream, uh, that is just seem to be no longer the case. Okay, you could update from CentOS 7 to CentOS 8, um, and for a while you could update from CentOS 8 to Stream. But at the moment, it seems that if you're if you have a CentOS 8 system, uh, you can not update it. Or convert it to stream, you have to reinstall from scratch. But I, 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 I thought Timothy said that the SCOS is going to be like RHEL Core OS. It's only going to be targeted at OKD as the underlying operating. So it's not something that you should potentially go out and use for generic projects. Right. That's right. It, it is well, going that, to be... that, that's today, yes. But I mean, the uh, but I guess it's based on uh, the CentOS Stream, which I, is now I think that, version nine. Yeah, but I, I think they say it very much as as the upstream version of RHEL Core OS. SCOS yeah. is the upstream version of RHEL Core OS, so it has the same use cases that RHEL Core OS has, which is right. OCP only today. Right. But obviously, S cost will be OKD only. So yeah. that's what my understanding. And Christian actually did this on the Dublin. He actually talked about this on the Dublin gathering. And he, the way he put it is, F cost is where we get all the latest Linux features. It it reacts very quickly to new features. Um, so that's the first place you're going to see new kernel features, new network manager features, new C group features. And all the great things. So that's the first place you see them. And OKD on FCOS is the first place you get to play with that stuff. If you want a more stable version, then SCOS will be that more stable, where it's had time to be hardened. And it is going to be the upstream of RHEL Core OS. So if you want a, a more stable platform, OKD on SCOS will give you that more, more stable, where new features have had time to be embedded, be checked out before they get it released into there. That's what Christian said on, on, on at the gathering. So I'll grab, I'll grab that video as soon as it's available and share it with everybody. But I, I, I want to go back to something that Bruce said, because I, I just want to have some clarity on it, that one of the issues, I, I think if I heard you right, is the upgrade process. So say you install OKD on SCOS um, and it's using, you know, a RHEL 9 or um, what, whatever the latest version is, and you wanted in RHEL 9.2 came out and you wanted to upgrade. Um, there is no tooling to do that. Um, well, it'd be more of a RHEL 10 one. Okay, RHEL 10. Okay, whatever. Yeah. Or, so. you know, SCOS 10 comes out. SCOS 10 comes out. There is no there is no tooling like there is for OKD on FCOS to do that upgrade. You just have to reinstall everything. Is, is that a correct interpretation of what it, you think is going to happen? 
Well, okay. I, the um, okay. So I, I I agree with the comments that the uh, OKD usage of it uh, and the machine operator and so on changes things considerably because uh, you are essentially uh, with the machine uh, config operator you are installing a new version rather than upgrading an old one. Okay. Um, so uh, so I guess that that, that my CentOS experience is mainly running it as an operating system. Yeah. Right. You have to and upgrade I, the operating system. Right. And, and, I, and I, I agree that that may not be applicable in, in this call. It's Yeah, it's not yeah. because if we're if we're talking about a core OS, a core OS has a different version, multiple versions of the operating system, essentially, um, lined up that you can select from to boot into, and essentially. You're you're not updating the OS. You're booting into a new. Right. Yeah. So that, that, I think that, that addresses yeah. that concern. Yeah. yeah. So 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 from an OKD perspective, the upgrades with S cost shouldn't be as shouldn't be pain, painful. Um, right. And so when, my concern actually is more fundamental, which is the, the lack of these upgrade facilities on the CentOS side leads me to have a feeling, which of course feelings can be totally incorrect, I agree with that, that uh, CentOS is uh, a step backwards in maturity from everything that we've had so far. And if it's, if it's an immature operating system framework, then it would give me concern to base a production system on it. But, but doesn't okay. it stand to reason that if it's going to become the upstream of our costs, that they're going to address issues pretty quickly? Uh, not necessarily. You think? Okay. Uh, uh, because uh, everybody's busy and priorities change. And it does take a while to get a community up to speed. Uh, so, like, I, I can believe the Fedora the Fedora community now is relatively mature. Yeah, I think what I, what I would say is it's a trust issue, right? What we have right. here is a classic open source trust issue. And, that, and that's kind of why um, having, to me, having the MVP available, trying to do the testing and deployment with it, building some trust that there are feedback mechanisms and processes, finding out whether it is FIPS compliant, um, you know, if we get that gain, um, what, you know, it, with the MVP. And what it means is both sides, the Red Hat engineering team that wants our feedback and wants our participation in this has to um, come to the table with some decent processes and communication skills um, if we're going to spend our time and energy doing testing of the MVP. First and foremost, and I think Timothy and the team and Stephen are, are totally okay with that, um, and and we'll do that. Um, and if nobody shows up at this hackathon and nobody tests it, then I don't believe. You know, I think they will have an internal release of OKD and SCOS going on, but they are not going to like if, if we don't do a little bit. Come the other 20 steps towards you know it's like square dancing or something. Um, we, you know, if we don't come a little way in and do some of this on the MVP, they're going to just go, okay, um, there is an interest in the community. So I think there is some interest in the community. I, I'll ask the question, Jamie, or maybe you can ask it of Christian um, as well about the FIPS compliant. I think that's a good solid use case. If this gets us to compliance, that's kind of huge. Um, and so that, yeah, but it, this is a classic trust, and we have built up a great relationship with the Fedora community around Fedora CoreOS, and we trust them to hear us, to do what's, you know, what we need, and they trust us to test their stuff and give them good feedback and collaborate. We need the same thing, but there is no real community there in the CentOS stream community. There are no bodies other than engineering resources from Red Hat. So, and if, and this is my concern, and I'll keep saying this, we get two minutes left, is if that's not going to be run as an open source community, there will never be 
a bunch of people, you know, managing the infrastructure and the release process for it, like the Fedora CoreOS. And I think um, so. And nobody from Fedora CoreOS is going to lose their job. Trust me on that, because most of them are Red Hatters um, uh, that are doing this work, and they're both doing both, like Timothy. Um, they, they're so that's that's not. I don't think they're. I think it's. I I just. I just think we're in a in this flux moment where we don't have the trust and we have the past experience with CentOS that you know has, it wasn't great. I will it burned admit. a lot of people. Burned a lot of people, you know, and um, so uh, you know we're asking to take this steps towards each other and start this dance again. Um, and everybody's been burned once, so um, you know I think that's it. The other thing, Jamie, that I wanted to say, um, Brian Cook. As the agenda item for next week um, for the main meeting. I just wanted to mention it here. Brian Cook is in my business unit and he is running um, and building tectonic based um, build pipelines as a service for Red Hat products and projects. He's got an initiative inside and he, I think he's got a few things that he's working on as pilot projects for this. And he's hoping to come next week um, and talk about it and he has been talking about the next thing that they might build as a service using these non prow based tectonic more modern shall we say pipelines could be okd and that's um that's separate from the operate first cloud because that would be on something else so i wanted to have him come next week and describe what he's doing to see if there's interest in us being you know the guinea pigs for that and that would probably be OKD with FCOS, but I don't have clarity on that. So there's another way to get OKD with FCOS built that we could also participate in. We would have access to the, the files and the logs, and so it'd be a little bit more public, but still run as a service with these pipelines on, I think, on AWS. Um, I was going to say, I think the importance is that at some point we get to the point where a community member can build OKD and produce a binary equivalent to what Red Hat releases? Because at the minute we can't. Yeah. There's no way that we know what happens in Prow to the extent that we can go and repeat that within the community outside Red Hat Firewall. I yeah. think to me that's an important thing. We end up with a process. So if for some reason Red Hat decides that resource constraints they can't put the same amount of resource into a, something that we rely on, we're not killed. I, I think that, that's the danger. That, that's yep. what we feel, that we are so beholden to Red Hat giving engineers time to work with us and produce things for us, that if that yep. stops, we die. And I think that's, that's the, I think that's some of the frustration that also boiled over. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think you hit that on the head. Now in the head. Right. I want to be mindful of time. The great thoughts yeah. from everyone in this meeting. This was a great meeting, great discussion. Um, we've got our to-dos there. Let's go forth with our to-dos, and then we'll bring these other things to the greater meeting uh, that I think probably should be fleshed out uh, in the greater meeting. Mm -hmm. All right. So thanks, folks. Okay. Appreciate your participation and continued efforts, and uh, talk to you next time. Thank you. Bye.